Hello, and welcome to the Alliance for Racial Equity and Child Welfare's webinar, Predictive Analytics and Child Welfare, a Broader View from the Field. We're pleased that our presenters today are Carol Hussey and Heather Baker from the Public Consulting Group. Today's webinar is the second in a series on predictive analytics and child welfare, the first featuring the state of Oregon and Allegheny County, Pennsylvania's creation and implementation of their predictive, predictive modeling tools. Today's presentation will start with an overview of predictive analytics for those who may have missed the first webinar, and it will also dig deeper into the potential for racially biased outcomes. Also, please join our conversation on Twitter using hashtag Alliance for Equity. That's Alliance, the number four equity. Our goals for today are to better understand how different analytic tools work to create predictive models, also to consider how implicit bias in decision making can inform predictive analytics, or if there is the possibility for informing predictive analytics. Last, to explore how we might use this information to create and implement tools that improve child welfare decision making. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping measures to keep in mind. First, this webinar is being recorded and the presentation will be sent to all registrants. Second, everyone is in listen-only mode. Please submit your questions using the chat feature that is in your um, control panel to the right of your screen. Questions will be collected and asked to our presenters at the end of their presentation. We'll have plenty of time for questions and answers. And while Heather and Carol are going to discuss some specific tools today, questions that are best for the developers themselves will be forwarded to them and the answers shared in our monthly newsletter. I'll turn it over to Carol and Heather to get started. Thank you, Tushira. This is Carol Hussey. I'm an associate manager with PCG. I've been with PCG since 2010. Uh, prior to that, I spent a number of years in financial services IT and then also uh, spent some time uh, with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I've been working in child welfare information systems now for about 17 years. So seen a wide array of uh, technology solutions implemented and reporting tools. And so we're going to talk a bit about that. Uh, Heather, do you want to give an introduction of yourself before we proceed? Sure. This is Heather Baker. I am a manager with Public Consulting Group. I'm responsible for the work that we do across the nation in child welfare and youth services. I've been with PCG since 2003, and before that I spent about five years in state budget finance for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Excellent. Thank you. So what we're going to step through today, um, you should see the, the agenda there in front of you. We're going to talk through, Tushira already did the session goals. I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to the methodology that we used in preparing for this presentation today. We'll go through some definitions and refreshers just to make sure that everyone is, is coming to the presentation with the same perspective on some of these words. Uh, we find that a lot of them are, are used sort of interchangeably, so we want to make sure that we're all clear on that. We will share with you some predictive analytics methods and examples of, of those. We'll talk about analytics and bias, of course, and considerations that you should undertake as you begin your own journey or continue with your journey uh, with analytics and predictive analytics. And then, as Tashira mentioned, we'll go through questions and, and answers at the end. Okay. Let's go forward. And so the methodology, um, I'll talk a little bit about that before we dive into the definitions. So the way we approached this was we identified five groups that are currently in some stage of implementation of a predictive analytics model in child welfare. You heard a couple of those um, in our last web, the first webinar. Um, we spoke with Oregon Health and Science University and Allegheny County, Pennsylvania. In addition to that, we spoke with representatives from IBM Watson, Mindshare Technologies, and SAS. So we really wanted to get a wide array of input into how are these implementations working, how do you use the tools, how are they being developed, and what are your outcomes. So we asked them a series of questions to understand first how each solution develops its predictive model. We were particularly interested in what sources of data they were using, the types of individuals and expertise involved in developing the algorithm. We also asked some questions around how the model or the algorithm impacts 
or is impacted by racial bias. So first we'll talk about some very high level differences between the different types of predictive models and then we'll talk about the conversations that we had relative to racial bias. So on slide eight, we begin with the definitions of predictive analytics. And we know there's a wide range of people attending the call today with different uh, degrees of expertise. So we're going to try to start by refreshing our understanding of the de definition of the terms we're using. Here we have two examples of how predictive analytics can be defined. Many of the solution providers that we talk to have their own definitions, but they all have a few things in common. So first, predictive analytics is a form of advanced data analytics. Predictive analytics can use a wide variety of, tech, uh, variety of technology, techniques that all use existing data sets to make predictions about future outcomes. Predictive analytics looks at what happened in the past that correlates for a particular outcome. And then it applies what it has learned about the past to current data in order to predict what may happen in the future. Okay, next slide. Then we want to talk about the definition of implicit bias. In advance of this session, CSSP sent out a link to the Harvard Implicit Association Test for Race. In our experience, some individuals who have taken this test have found it to be incredibly enlightening and helpful in concretely understanding bias. We recommended this exercise as a method of stimulating an awareness and a recognition that bias exists in all of us, even where we think it may not. Beginning with the recognition that bias is all around us, we can engage in a more meaningful conversation about bias and predictive analytics. So we provided a definition here from the National Center for State Courts, and I'll just read through that quickly. Unlike explicit bias, which reflects the attitudes or beliefs that one endorses at a conscious level, Implicit bias is the bias in judgment and or behavior that results from subtle cognitive processes, for example, implicit attitudes and implicit stereotypes, that often operate at a level below conscious awareness and without intentional control. We feel that that is a really great definition for implicit bias and that it really suits our purpose for this discussion today. We've also included here a quote from President Barack Obama. And we've, we've provided this because the president acknowledged here as early as 2014 that consent of hidden or implicit bias as a factor in some major events was, was a, an issue that we need to address. So we raised this to illustrate that the president talks about a concept that had previously been primarily discussed in academic context, but this concept has now entered into our national discourse. Okay, next slide. Now we'll talk a little bit about data analytics outputs. Most of you are familiar with descriptive analytics. Um, it tends to come up pretty frequently when people talk about analytics. It's probably one of the most prevalent kinds uh, that are out there. But there are some distinctions. I think somebody, if somebody could put their phone on mute, please. So descriptive analytics are the ways that we can look at and understand what is happening now and in the past. So we could ask a research question, we could look into data to reveal what's happened historically or to answer a question. These can take the form of various uh, products, research findings, management reports, and there are also a wide number of ways to use that data that, that describes what's already happened. Predictive analytics, on the other hand, work to take what we know about what happened in the past and build models and algorithms that help us figure out and predict what's going to happen in the future, if you remember our definition. So one of the most well-recognized predictive algorithms that's broadly used today is the algorithm that Netflix uses to make recommend recommendations for what other shows you might like to watch. That is an algorithm that tolerates a lot of false positives because the consequences of a Netflix algorithm being wrong are really low. Child welfare, broadly speaking, and child protection more specifically, are very high stakes endeavors. And so it's important to say that the people building these solutions are building them to perform with much greater predictive accuracy than a Netflix algorithm. So what do we do about that? Well, what we heard from some of the folks we spoke with was that they had developed a next step. 
a way to actually use the information to prompt action, to suggest the next step, or to track what steps correlated with a better outcome. We'll get back to that later, but it's important for us to highlight that the end goal of the predictive modeling and child welfare, child protection, is to change the trajectory of a child or family's life so that the outcomes are better. And to do that, you need to know more than what the predictive modeling is telling you. You have to be prepared to act differently in that child and family's life. Okay, next slide. Sources of data. So we published evidence is, of course, the output of research findings from various research institutions or organizations. And some of these findings are broad-based and commonly known. Others may be more specialized and focused. There are various methods of machine learning, but generally machine learning is the automation of building analytical models. This is achieved using algorithms that learn iteratively from the data that's being used. Some solutions that we talk to use one or the other, but there are some that are really considering both to get a more comprehensive view. The development of the algorithm can be informed by research findings and your data. Using both approaches is better to identify the children and family who are most at risk and then direct concentrated support to help them and their families. Using the research and the data helps you identify the outcomes that matter and what data can be used as proxies for those outcomes. I'll give you some examples here on the next slide. Just one second, please, Carol. Can I please ask that everyone with a presentation link put themselves on mute? Thank you. Thank you, Tashara. So some examples of predicted, predictive algorithms and, and how they might be used um, based on those various approaches. So policy could be informed by research, and policy that based, that's based on research and evidence findings can also be implemented outside of the use of data to direct interventions. For example, research tells us that hungry children are not ready to learn. So many school districts offer breakfast to all children. They don't use data to find the hungry children and then direct breakfast to them. They universally offer breakfast to all children. But here we want to talk about the ways the data can be useful in directing resources, attention, interventions, and services to specific groups. And there are several ways to do that. So if we think about research only, studies show that chronic absenteeism and low GPA correlate to early dropout rates for youth 14 and older. Using the school district's administrative data set, a school develops an early warning system that flags youth who miss a certain number of days of school and have a GPA under a threshold suggested by research to predict who's at a higher risk of dropping out. These models can be applied uniformly to any school district. It's not specific to a school. If we talk about using local data only, if an organization wanted to predict the likelihood that a reunification would be successful in active cases, five years of child-related, child welfare-related data and some limited additional Medicaid data might be available. And data scientists would develop an algorithm to identify and weight the variables that impact this outcome within the five-year local data set. An example of using both research methods and data might look like this. An organization wants to predict the likelihood of maltreatment for specific children using linked data for parents and children from birth records, public assistance, public safety, homelessness, Medicaid, and school district data sets. A large body of research is reviewed to determine which data for, uh, from which of those sources is most likely to impact the outcome. And the data scientists focus on the set of data elements indicated in the research to develop an algorithm to weight the selected variables that impact this outcome. The algorithm is typically tested, fine-tuned using local and linked data sets. And you get a more comprehensive view of the uh, population that you're, you're serving there. And it's important to note that different solution providers are using different data sets to build their algorithms. Now I'm going to turn the presentation over to my colleague, Heather, who will guide us through the discussion regarding the relationship between racial bias and predictive analytics. 
Thanks, Carol. So in advance of the webinar, as Carol mentioned, uh, CSSP sent the link to the implicit association test. And we sent the test um, so that we could begin with a shared premise that implicit bias exists. So our premise today for the rest of the discussion is that human beings make decisions that are informed by our own experiences and learning. We may not always be aware of the assumptions and underlying bias that inform our decision making. On the basis of this premise, we ask the question, if predictive analytics are based on a history of human decision making, and that decision making was informed by implicit bias, are we hard coding human bias into our predictions? When we asked the solution providers to talk about predictive analytics and bias, we got a range of answers. So I'm going to talk through those answers in the next slide. One of the answers that we heard was no. That by using large data sets from multiple sources, individual bias is diluted. And the evidence for this is that existing predictive algorithms that are built on historical decision making do not reveal race as a relevant factor in predicting poor outcomes. So one could come to the conclusion that predictive analytics helps to address the problem of racial bias because analytic models that currently exist to solve a specific question have revealed that the race of a child didn't correlate or didn't matter when considering risk for a specific bad outcome. In the next slide, we also encountered the answer, yes. Um, and this was a very simple response. If there's bias in the data that fuels the algorithm, the output of the algorithm will include the bias. Bias in the data set will result in bias in the analytics. But on the next slide, we uh, discuss how the answer, in some cases, from some folks was both. So um, one answer being yes, the data has limitation. If there's bias in the data, the bias will be in the analytics. This can play out in a couple of different ways. To follow our premise, caseworkers make decisions that are influenced by implicit bias. A family that looks like the caseworker follows the same faith tradition as the caseworker, lives in a neighborhood that feels safe to the caseworker. The caseworker might make a different decision in this case than in a case where the family looks different, has a different faith, lives in a different neighborhood. The decisions made by the caseworker are influenced by her bias and experience, and those decisions are represented in the data that is used to make a prediction in a future case. The bias is in the data, so the bias is in the output of the data. There's another way that bias, both explicit and implicit, manifests in our data. Let's talk about the example of a child with an incarcerated father. If we accept as a premise that black men are disproportionately incarcerated as a result of racial inequality in our criminal justice system, the impact of that racial inequality, the incarceration of the father, may also correlate with a bad outcome for the child of the incarcerated father. How and why the father became incarcerated may be connected to racial injustice, but the fact that the father is incarcerated may increase the risk of the child for a bad outcome. As a result, Predictive models may reveal that circumstances in a family's life that are influenced by racial inequality increase the risk that a child will have a poor outcome. We can understand and acknowledge that racial bias exists in our data, that the impact of racial inequality manifests in our predictions, and also say that these models can influence a better, less biased future decision, which leads us to that overlap with the no answer. Decision support or quality control by the use of a predictive model may help you make a decision that you wouldn't have made just given the information and experience 
experience that you have access to on your own. Predictive analytics can help you make a different decision based on a different, more robust set of information than you would have had without the analytics. And I want to quote Aaron Dalton, who presented at the last webinar um, from, a, from a recent um, article that she was in. And she said, we have to be really careful in a discussion of um, analytic models for child welfare agencies. She said, quote, we can either keep doing the same thing that we've been doing, and I don't think many people would say that the child protection systems here in the US are working perfectly, or we can explore whether on the margin data and analytics can help us move closer to a system where we think that the kids who are at the greatest risk are being correctly identified. And I think that is a good um, quote to address this uh, slide that presents that there could be both a yes and no answer to this question that results in uh, the appropriate use of predictive analytics to impact better outcomes for children. So that moves us to our third section of the presentation which is the considerations that we um, have come across in all of these discussions that we've been having and what we've learned from organizations that are implementing predictive analytics models now. The first is to be ready. So it became really evident um, in many of our discussions that the actual deployment of a predictive model may not take a very long time. Some of the solution providers are ready and able to create a, a predictive solution in a matter of weeks, but they all emphasize that there is work that has to happen before, during, and after the implementation of a predictive model. And so these are some of the things that have to happen as you're preparing to implement. The problem has to be well-defined. In all of our interviews and analysis, it was clear that the problem or use case must be well-defined before beginning the analysis. Writing a problem statement that is clear, free of ambiguity, and concise is a critical first step. And that can take some time. Similarly, outcomes have to be well-defined and documented so that you know and are prepared for what you're building a predictive, the problem, the outcome that you're looking for um, that solves the problem that predictive analytics are being deployed to address. Executive sponsorship. Analytics efforts take time and money and require change. There will also be challenges and barriers that require executive support, support to mitigate and address. Securing executive sponsorship and commitment is an essential component to securing the resources needed to begin the effort and to sustain it. In the areas where we have seen progress, there have been strong and committed leaders at the helm. Reliable data. Many agencies that we talk to tell us that they have data quality concerns as it relates to even simple reporting needs. This will be further compounded by adding more data sets to an analytic effort. The issue of data quality must be addressed before you begin to use those, that data to perform advanced analytics. You could spend considerable time cleaning your data. At some point, you move forward knowing that it's not going to be perfect, but that you are comfortable enough with the quality of your data to proceed. Good data is a lifestyle, not a project. Key ongoing activities include developing and updating data dictionaries, training staff, performing cleanup efforts like eliminating duplicates, and defining data mapping strategies. You have to be ready to change practice. Determining what is actionable and what is not is a challenge, but change will be necessary. And I want to go back to an earlier slide where uh, we talked about the third step in deploying predictive analytics, and that is being prepared to do something with the output of your predictive model. There, will be, there may be necessary changes to policy and practice. There will be technology changes, training needs, operational change management to consider. The value of data analysis is that it brings transparency and insight into our operations in a way that we might not otherwise have known. It has a huge impact on your supervisors, your staff, 
clients, the people you serve. And so before um, implementation, you need to be ready to communicate and support all of these actors as necessary as they adjust to changes in policy and practice. And then and it be ready to invest in an evaluation and monitoring. We've seen this in um, several places that have made a transition to implementing predictive models. Uh, making an investment in monitoring whether the outcomes that you desired at the outset of the project are being realized, being ready to make an investment in an evaluation that will be a third, represent a third party, and considering um, an evaluation both of your outcomes and the changes in your process that accompany implementation of analytic models. The next consideration is to be humble. We can go to the next slide. One of um, the best quotes that we heard was, all models are wrong, some are useful. To acknowledge that false positives can occur, to understand that using data analytics requires some art and science, there is decision making involved as data models are developed and implemented. Again, to study the impact using evaluation and monitoring and being willing at any point to change course. We want to emphasize that the journey in analytics is a journey. Some of the most opinionated and informed people who we've interviewed have been working on these efforts for a number of years. I'm sure many would admit that it took longer than they thought and that they've had some twists and turns along the way. It takes time and you won't know everything up front. It is a learning process. Be clear about that up front. Being clear about that up front establishes clear expectations for everyone involved. Approaching the journey in a humble way is not only wise relative to the people aspects of the effort, but it's also a great way to mitigate risk and allow for a continued evaluation of the effort. It allows us to be continuously reflective on whether uh, the course that we've chosen is getting us to where we wanted to go and to be willing to change course if necessary. And then the last um, consideration that we heard repeatedly and that I think might be able to correct some fairly common misconceptions when it comes to how predictive analytics can be used in child welfare and child protection is to consider how to use predictive analytics for a positive answer action. What I mean by that is to use, to associate your predictive analytics models with directing services, resources, and interventions towards families and children who need them most, or to improve worker quality, perform quality assurance, or staff development. We uh, spoke to individuals who really strongly emphasize that in a lot of cases what the predictive models in child protection were revealing were ways in which worker quality can have an impact on poor outcomes. And so the use of the predictive modeling is happening at the quality assurance level, at the supervisory level, so that supervisors or other quality assurance staff can identify where caseworkers need additional training and support, and also identify where um, a lack of quality in caseworker performance might be increasing a child's risk for a negative outcome so that they can quickly intervene and change course for that child. Um, and uh, additionally, the, um, there, are some, there are a couple of models in deployment that are really focused on prevention services and in intervening um, with a family or a child with positive supports before um, child protection services is involved. And so there was a considerable um, emphasis that predictive analytics should not be and is not being used currently, according to those that we spoke to, in a punitive way. None of the folks that we spoke to are using predictive models, for example, to identify which children should be removed from the home. The kinds of questions that child protection is currently using predictive analytics to solve are questions that have more to do with providing support to a family or improving the oversight of how workers are intervening and um, assisting children who are in their care. <laughs>
Most of the people we talked to spoke strongly about a desire to be transparent and the need to communicate. Being clear about intent is the best way to alleviate fear and concern regarding analytics efforts. The goal here is to make a positive impact using modern technology to assist trained and educated social workers. Predictive analytics cannot replace good case practice. So with that, Shira, we are ready to move to questions and answers. Great. Thank you, Heather, and Carol, as well, for a great discussion. We really appreciate the opportunity to dig deeper into implicit bias and the potential for bias in our predictive modeling tools. Um, one quick question, this is a point of clarification. Can you tell us a bit more, Heather, about why you chose the vendors you did um, to interview for today's presentation? Sure. So, um, we, so we talked to folks that we had a pretty um, solid understanding of their presence currently in the predictive analytics market um, and where we knew that solutions were either in deployment or in the process of being deployed. Um, I'm sure that there are other providers out there, but we felt that across the board, the five folks that we spoke to represented uh, a pretty wide variety of both public and private um, people who are invested in producing solutions uh, that are predictive analytics. So we tried to get a cross-section of different kinds of solution providers. Great. Thank you. My first question from the audience, and I encourage folks to please join into the discussion using the chat feature um, in your webinar panel. Also, we have a lively discussion occurring on Twitter at hashtag Alliance for Equity. That's Alliance the number for equity. Um, but our first question from our audience is, does our big data capacity, which allows us to look across generations of child welfare engagement, make it more or less likely that implicit bias can creep into the case decisions we make? So I think that this goes back to the yes or no uh, slide that we presented. So on the one hand, um, the, the answer that we heard fairly consistently from those who said that yes, there's bias that exists in the data would say, no matter how big your data set, no matter how diverse um, the sources are, if there is bias in the data that's inputted into the system and that data is used in a predictive model, then the predictive model will not, doesn't cleanse the data. It's using that data to inform its predictions. So on the one hand, um, the diversity of your data set doesn't necessarily mitigate the fact that if there's implicit bias in your data set, um, it will be in your analytics. That's one of the answers that we heard. I think one of the um, corresponding, not counter arguments, but accompanying arguments is still that the more robust the data set, the more sources of information you're pulling from, the better a picture you're getting of the family and the child. And the more, um, the more data sets you're using, the more different perspectives you're getting on that child and that family. And so if you are able to access a family's public assistance records, if you're able to also understand a family's Medicaid or medical history, in addition to what you are encountering in your own interactions with the family, and all of that information is supporting, is included in a data model that um, supports your decision making, um, that that, help, that does help to mitigate bias because you're making decisions based on a broader amount of information than you would have made given just your own information that you have access to and the experiences that you are bringing into that decision. Thank you for that clarity. Carol, do you have anything to add? No, I think she covered it. You know, I mean, the, the, the issue that, that we continue to see is there's, there's a fear of predictive analytics solutions further propagating the bias. Um, and so, you know, we, we can tackle that in, in any number of ways, but it's, it's really not the product or the tool that is where the problem lies. And I think it also does get back to, you know, what are you going to do with the output of it? You know, how, how do you plan to use this? And um, 
making your intent with that be the driving factor for the follow-on actions that are defined. Thank you. You all both have mentioned data quality as a concern and even as a major barrier in implementing predictive modeling tools. How are jurisdictions that you're working with overcoming the data quality issues? Mm -hmm. I can take that if you want, Heather. Um, so, you know, there, there are some technical components that you can look at in terms of data quality, right? There are many tools out there and firms that do data cleanup efforts. Uh, you know, like the deduplication, you know, example that we gave. There are also um, other ways to mitigate data quality that are more um, human-oriented, right? So one of the, the things that is pretty prevalent uh, that, that needs to be addressed, and I'm, I'm seeing people work on more, is uh, data definitions, developing clear data definitions, um, sharing that and training your, your workforce so that everybody's clear on what that data means when they're putting it into the system. And as we talk about integrating many data sets for the use of analytics, um, it becomes even more important, right? Because even if your own staff are very clear on your data definitions, you're now using data from these various other organizations and entities who may speak a different language than you. So as you start to develop um, data sharing agreements and working with other entities, particularly ones that are outside of your purview, that's a critical first step. Defining what those data elements mean, ensuring that you're mapping people together properly, establishing data standards um, is helpful. And so uh, for those of you who are familiar with CWIS, which is the new Child Welfare Information System regulations that have been published by ACF, there is a clear component uh, that requires states to establish a data quality plan and to uh, be uh, have a monitoring uh, process for that as well. So I think that's going to help a lot, but, but we do need to think outside of our organizations as we start to utilize and consume data uh, from other organizations. Are you all aware of any jurisdictions that might be using predictive analytics to predict serious injury? to children or maltreatment fatalities. I know Heather mentioned the many positive ways, quote unquote positive ways, that the technology can be used. Any awareness around uh, maltreatment or fatalities that you've come across? Sure, I can take that um, at a high level. Yeah, a couple of the um, folks who are really uh, doing a lot of work in this area, I know that many of you have probably heard Mindshare Technologies and Eckerd. Uh, their partnership on rapid safety feedback has um, been cited frequently as one of the ways in which predictive analytics have been deployed to help caseworkers and casework supervisors um, assess the risk for uh, child fatality and child maltreatment. And so that's being deployed uh, in Hillsborough County and the rapid safety feedback model is being currently being deployed in several other jurisdictions. And I'm sure that um, we could follow up with some additional information from Mindshare. I believe that SAS, and I know they're doing work in North Carolina, although I'm not sure if this is where they've built this particular model, but I do believe that SAS has also developed a um, child fatality risk assessment model um, and the contact that has been graciously talking to us about uh, SAS's work is Will Jones and I think he would also be very willing to share some of the um, information about how that model is being developed and deployed. Those are the two that I'm aware of that specifically focus on ch in, within Child Protective Services looking at um, maltreatment or fatality. Thank you. Another question um, is about child welfare policy and practice. Do you all know of any specific examples of how predictive analytics have, have resulted in changes in policy and practice on the child welfare side? So again, this might be a good conversation to um, talk to some of the developers because I don't want to give them the short shrift in explaining the specific things that they're doing. Um, but in in the cases where on, on the child protection side, I know that the um, 
the predictive models for repeat maltreatment, for child fatality, for um, uh, um, failed reunification. Uh, models like that are being used to direct attention of supervisors and quality control folks, both to intervene specifically with caseworkers, but also to understand which types of interventions are most successful at reducing a child's risk score for a fault. Um, for a negative outcome. So in other words, some of what, this is all part of what are you going to do with the information. So the predictive models that have been developed, there's also a um, what are you going to do about it phase where the um, user of the data, which in most cases is not directly being accessed by the caseworker, um, it, it, that's a different um, on the hotline side of things, if it's on the intake side, then the intake worker is uh, using the predictive model. But even that score is not necessarily being conveyed to the caseworker or the investigator that takes over the case. Um, but I digress. The um, how child welfare agencies that are using these predictive models react to the information is where the policy and practice is the most important. What are they going to do to change the outcome for the child? It's not enough just to know that a child is at greater risk. And so making investments in different kinds of interventions, tracking which interventions with a particular child helps to decrease their risk, that is all part of the what are you going to do with the information side of things. Yeah, and, and I would just add to that too, Heather. Um, most of the people that are implementing this, I mean, we should probably say, you know, this is still fairly new in child welfare. And as we mentioned earlier, some of the folks that we spoke with are proceeding cautiously. And so there are um, certainly with Allegheny County and the work they're doing, you know, they're they're very much evaluating everything that's going on. They have, you know, they're, they have milestones identified where they're going to, you know, revisit you know, what those outcomes and, and perform those evaluations. And I think that's, that's important to note. I would imagine that they certainly expect that there will be changes. And then when you change, you also have to evaluate the efficacy of those changes. So it's, it's a constant process, right? It, it doesn't just stop. With I, the idea of um, practice and policy change in mind, do you all have any recommendations for um, workforce development around how jurisdictions would implement a predictive modeling tool with fidelity and or help reduce the chance for algorithmic bias in their implementation? So I think some of the things that we talked about with regard to um, being ready for implementation and also um, sort of some of the humility aspects speak to being prepared to implement change in the workforce. So it depends on uh, who is the user of the predictive analytic model as to how broadly um, different levels of training have to happen in your workforce. Uh, in child protection, we have seen these models deployed at a quality assurance level or a supervisor level where the receiver of the predictive um, output, so maybe it's a risk score that is continuously refreshed based on the algorithm, is using that information to um, direct caseworker improvement if you have a caseworker that consistently has cases with an, a higher score for the potential of a failed reunification because of a missed home visit. That's another area where you can say, okay, this, this is a workforce training issue that I have even with this particular worker. Um, as far as preparing your, uh, the end user of the analytics, that has to be a huge part of your planning and implementation process. Um, um, developing the right kinds of training tools, but also sort of daily process change support so that people are not just uh, attending a single classroom style training and given a tool and asked to use it. That's not the right model for true systemic change implementation. Um, you want to be giving uh, the user, the end user of the models um, updated policies, updated procedures, 
supervisory um, supervisors that know and understand how this um, change is supposed to be used, managed, and introduced. So I think that yes, there are enormous workforce training considerations that have to take that we have to take into account. There's process change considerations, but those need to be focused on the, the individuals who are mostly impacted by the use of the predictive models. And so um, it may be that while you are looking at the um, decisions that are being made by a very large workforce, that the people who are really using the, the outputs of a predictive model is a much smaller group of people and um, that that getting that change implemented and the correct fidelity to the model is a lot more manageable with a smaller unit of people. So I think it really depends on who, on the kinds of models that you're developing and really being thoughtful about the scale of the change in daily practice that you're introducing and having the right accompanying change management, workforce training, um, decision support for them, supervisory procedures in place to implement. And as Carol and I both mentioned, um, having that ongoing monitoring um, is also really helpful. Doing the evaluation that we've seen Allegheny County undergo, they're doing both a process evaluation and an outcomes evaluation. So they're looking at what has changed in our process that is working? Is it well supported? Are the workers able to um, maintain fidelity to the model? As well as, is the use and implementation of the analytics actually impacting the change that I want it to impact? Um, and and, and uh, the change in outcomes that I intended it to impact. So um, that was a long answer, but I think that's a complicated question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, while we're on the topic of agencies, and then I want to skip back to a few questions that we've gotten more specifically about bias and institutional racism, um, I do want to ask about community engagement. So very often with the Alliance, we not only are pushing um, jurisdictions to collect data better and to disaggregate data be better, but also to share it with the community, with the people who are most impacted. Do you know of any of the agencies with which you're working are sharing um, the scores from predictive analytics tools with the community, and if so, how that might be informing practice? So the risk scores and who gets to see the risk scores, I think, is has been fairly limited, uh, particularly uh, for an individual case, certainly. Um, for example, I know on the intake side, I mentioned earlier that the risk score that might be associated with a, a call that comes into intake, whether it's a very high risk score or a medium risk score, that risk score isn't even communicated, I believe, to the investigator because they don't want the risk score to drive the investigation. They want the investigative practice to, to go um, as normally as it normally progresses and not be swayed one way or another by whether or not the score was very high or medium high. The, as long as the score was sufficient to kick off an investigation, that's really all the investigator needs to know. Um, as far as how the, this information is communicated to the community, I think you have to be really careful about over-promising. Um, we certainly have seen the impact of some of these, um, the implementation of some very effective predictive modeling tools um, in the rapid safety feedback tool, and I think we, the communities who use that tool did see a significant reduction in child fatality, uh, and that is something that was well reported in the local media and talked about a great deal. Um, the challenge to that is that if a subsequent child fatality occurs, it, it becomes a situation where you don't, it's hard to walk back. You know, you want to make sure that people in the community understand that these are tools and that they don't, uh, we have to be humble about it. They're, they're going to be helpful. They are going to improve the quality of the services uh, delivered if they're implemented appropriately and um, used properly and with fidelity. But in communication with the community, it's, it's hard to adequately convey the amount of, um, caution that goes into 
a lot, you know, saying that the predictive model is solving our problems. I think that that's not exactly what we want to be communicating. I think that child welfare agencies are working really hard to use every tool at their disposal to uh, have safer communities and safer kids um, and improve the well-being of kids in their communities, and this is one of those tools. Any thoughts, Carol? No, I, th I think she's got it right there. Um, I, I wouldn't add anything to that. I, I would. I think that a lot of organizations are just cautious in how they're implementing it right now because it is so new, and it's certainly, um, as we said earlier, it's a high stakes kind of area, right? And so they're starting with the areas that, um, you know, are less risky in that regard. I, I've not seen any other places where it's been implemented in that way. Thank you. We got a question that goes back to Heather's great example around um, incarceration. So if a child has an incarcerated parent who happens to be a black male understanding the racial injustices in this country around mass incarceration, um, what does that mean for our predictive modeling? And so I know uh, Heather, you gave a list of great considerations regarding implementation, but the million dollar question is, what do we do with that example that you gave? And, and I don't mm -hmm. want to put you guys on the spot to ask you to solve institutional racism in this call or in this webinar because I know that's impossible, but what are some of your reflections about what we should be doing with that understanding? Well, I think what we want to be saying really clearly is that um, the the impact of racial injustice on children may result in a predictive model saying that a child at higher risk for a bad outcome because they are experiencing the impact of um, racial injustice on their family circumstances. That's the point I'm trying to make there is that um, the impact of having um, inequality in our criminal justice system, of limiting access to safe neighborhoods by discriminatory practices, all of those things are real. Um, they will show up in data because they are circumstances that exist in the, in the lives of children. Predictive analytics doesn't solve any of those problems. Um, it helps, it may help us to see that um, factors in a child's life that are impacted by racial injustice do increase the child's risk for poor outcomes in a, in a very concrete way through these predictive models, but the predictive models are not intended or not capable of solving those problems. They're capable of helping a caseworker understand how the impact of those circumstances can increase a child's risk for a bad outcome. Thank you for that. On the topic, again, of race and bias, um, do you all think it would be helpful for child welfare systems to have discussions um, with staff and leadership around implicit bias and how it might be affecting policy and practice? So I'm not, this is, I'm not an expert, and I don't, um, in this topic, um, and so I want to approach it with some humility. I think that the conversation about disproportionality um, and over-representation of black children and families in our child welfare um, system has been well documented. I think that we might be, over the past couple of years, and the point that we made um, about uh, the quote from President Obama where he referred to hidden biases in a very public uh, press conference on a very, at a very challenging time um, for the nation um, reveals that these are conversations that continue to be relevant and should continue to be had. I would definitely defer to and recommend that child welfare directors who are looking to address issues of racial injustice and implicit bias in their child welfare systems look to the academic work um, and contributions that people of color have made to this conversation. Um, but I certainly would say that disproportionality itself has been a, a, a raging topic in child welfare that gets attention 
periodically um, over the years, and this might be a very good moment for us to revisit some of the issues that lead to disproportionality. Um, we can certainly do some follow-up along with Tashira to look at resources for child welfare agencies who are willing to engage in those conversations with their workers. Thank you, Heather. We think that was a very thoughtful answer. Um, so on back to the topic of um, how predictive analytics is helpful. Someone chatted in and said, I understand the concern about replacing worker judgment. However, there are stories daily across the country demonstrating that some workers' judgment may not be good for kids. Can better use of data and analytics improve outcomes? So it's kind of that split part of the discussion that you all have been mentioning. While we're focusing today so much on algorithmic bias, what about those opportunities to actually help reduce it? If you could speak a bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is one of the um, most compelling arguments in favor of implementing predictive models in, in child welfare and in um, child and family serving organizations. And that is simply that the, the kinds of issues and problems and the complexities of working with real children and families um, exceed the capacity of most people to consistently make a great decision every time. And so we definitely see examples of workers who make extremely bad decisions in the media from time to time. And what we don't necessarily see are younger and experienced workers or workers who are experienced but have gotten into a habit of relying on the same providers or who have seen um, a particular circumstance replicate itself so many times that they think that it's a fact. Um, so these aren't necessarily bad workers who are making terrible decisions. They're just human beings who are working with, with um, very complex human problems. And so predictive analytics is a way to give those workers or the supervisors of those workers some tools and some um, guidance that comes from a data set that's more robust than the data that they have at their fingertips, the information that they're collecting from the family, but information that's been collected by different people in different circumstances and to, to use data models to make recommendations to them um, about what to do next. To say, you know, my gut is telling me that this child is at um, a high risk for repeat maltreatment, but the predictive analytics model might say they're not, that's not based on the evidence that's been used to inform this predictive model, the child's risk for a bad outcome is less than the worker thinks. So it diversifies the amount of information that the worker has to draw from to make better decisions. I think that's the, the prevailing argument in favor of predictive analytics, that um, it's another tool that a, that a caseworker or a casework supervisor um, or a quality assurance unit can use um, to enhance and improve decision making at the caseworker level. Thank you. So that was our last question. I will actually turn it over to Carol and Heather to share any last thoughts while I advance the slides backwards to get to their contact information for folks who may have lingering questions. Sure, I can go first. I think what we want to emphasize to folks is that there's a lot of existing conversations about predictive analytics in child welfare. We had, um, we learned, we've been, Carol and I have been working in this field, talking to solution providers, talking to child welfare agency directors and workers for several years to try to understand how um, data models can be used to strengthen caseworker decisions and all of the challenges that go along with implementing um, these kinds of decision support tools. I think we've been um, very impressed with the process that um, we've seen some jurisdictions go through, and specifically Allegheny County, again, is one that has taken a very thoughtful approach to um, building a predictive model to solve a specific problem to training workers, to evaluating outcomes and impact. And so we're watching that implementation very closely. Um, 
we think, I think I can speak for Carol and I and many of us at TCG who have been working in this space, that caseworkers need um, everything that they can access to improve how they're able to make the right decision in any circumstance. That can be predictive analytics tools, that can be um, other actuarial support, support tools and risk um, assessment and safety assessment tools that are used in a single moment as opposed to an ongoing um, predictive model that might be running all the time. There is a wide variety of tools that can support case worker decision making and we um, believe that predictive analytics models, if acted upon, if um, monitored properly, if implemented with fidelity, if used towards positive outcomes, or, or used for a positive out action um, in a jurisdiction that's committed and ready to use them, can be a way to improve how uh, child welfare agencies serve children and families. So we are happy for any follow-up from folks on the webinar, we can answer questions and we can also um, send questions out to the five uh, groups that we spoke to to get uh, more robust answers that draw from a wide range of experience. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, Carol, anything to add? Uh, the only thing I would add is, you know, I mean, it, for, for me personally, um, you know, I've worked in child welfare for many years, as I'm sure many of you have. And I feel like this is the only way we are going to move the needle from reactive to proactive in child welfare. And, you know, I certainly want us to do that in the most um, ethically uh, based way that we can. Um, I feel like the workers are, are really in a very difficult position every single day they walk out the door in terms of their case loads, the stress levels, the challenges that they have with the processes and the technologies that they use. And the use of analytics will allow them to harness the power of these tools in such a way that it really supports what they need to do so that they can focus on what they signed up for, which is being really good social workers. And so this is one of those areas that we feel will help achieve those things and to support the caseworkers in better serving children and families. So, you know, my, my, my goal is to, um, to help people approach it in an educated way, uh, to not dismiss it out of fear, because I think that happens a lot and also to understand that there are ways to do it, uh, to use these tools for good. And, and that's really kind of leveraging what, what Heather just said. So we appreciate the opportunity to share our position on that and to help others think through it. Um, it's a tough subject, you know, to talk about. We know that there are a lot of problems that are probably bigger than, you know, our purview uh, in some cases, but we, we think there are ways to still make progress um, despite the, those environmental challenges. Thank you both to Carol and Heather. I'm sure I speak for all of today's registrants and participants to say that this has been a very insightful conversation. We're so pleased that we were able to deepen our knowledge around um, um, predictive analytics, but also the potential for racial bias. Um, especially the very thoughtful work that you all did by speaking to individual vendors to help inform our discussion today. Um, this will not be the last webinar that the Alliance will be hosting on the topic. Please stay tuned for an announcement in early 2017 for our next webinar. Um, we think we're getting very deep again in the topic, especially given that we're still so early in child welfare systems around implementation. However, we want to go in with the right considerations on the table. So that's the purpose of all of these discussions. The webinar will be available, the recording and the slides. We will email those out to everyone who registered. Please visit us at cssp.org to learn more about the Alliance and also sign up for our newsletter. That's all for today. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.